Hello and welcome to the latest video in my Introduction to International Relations series. So, first of all, apologies for not having uploaded any content for the past three weeks or so. Um, the truth is that work has just been absolutely hectic, I've just been under a huge amount of pressure um, and I really just haven't had any time to create any videos um, for the past few weeks. So I did promise in the last video, I did promise that I would be uploading a video on the United Nations um, and on realist versus liberal perspectives on the United Nations. I still intend to make that video um, but haven't had a chance yet. Um, and also the next video in my IR theory series which will look at um, neo-Marxist perspectives on, um, on international relations. Again, that's waiting in the wings, um, just waiting to get a little bit of time to actually be able to create that video. However, um, what I do want to share with you today is a lecture that I recently gave on the theme of globalisation. So I've kind of mentioned the concept of globalisation previously um, in the uh, kind of introduction to international relations, one of the, the very first videos that I created, um, touched on the concept of globalisation there. Um, so I'd like to kind of share this lecture with you which um, really kind of expands upon that theme. So this is the first of our kind of supplementary lectures. So the first one um, is globalisation. Um, let's talk a bit about globalisation. So again it's a term that obviously we use a lot in IR and when we're talking about current affairs. Um, but what exactly does it mean? You know, there's not necessarily one single definition of globalisation and, you know, there's not necessarily um, agreement on what it means as well. There are multiple different definitions. But generally, when we talk about globalisation, we're talking about a process by which the world is becoming increasingly interconnected. So again, we're not talking about a one-time thing, something that has an event that has happened. We're talking about an ongoing process. Um, and we're talking about increasing levels of interconnection in different spheres of political and economic <coughs> and social and cultural life. So increasing interconnections. So again, historically, we've had, you know, the world has kind of been made up of multiple different civilizations, really. Um, I mean, again, how far back do you want to go? Of course, I mean, humanity kind of originated in East Africa, um, and there have been kind of multiple waves of migration from East Africa out to the rest of the world over the course of hundreds of thousands of years. Um, the most recent kind of being in the last sort of 70,000 years or so. Um, but in kind of historical times, so kind of coming forward to you know the last few thousand years, there have kind of been multiple um, different civilizations in different parts of the world, and they ne haven't necessarily had that much interaction with each other. But in recent centuries, and particularly in recent decades, we're seeing a shift towards a more global world. You know, we're seeing a sense that the borders between societies and cultures are being broken down um, or transcended. That's important for us um, because again our discipline is called international relations and traditionally that's what it was about. It was about relationships between nations, between nation states. But increasingly we're talking about a new level now of political and social and cultural organisation which is not about individual nations at all. It's about the global level. It's about a new society, a new form of society um, emerging at the global level. So this idea of the global village, if you like. Um, so again, a lot of this is to do, of course, with economics. So again, we're seeing an increasingly interconnected global economy. Um, and we can see the effects of that. For example, you remember a couple of years back when the Suez Canal got blocked? Um, so that the ships coming from Africa, from the Far East, instead of being able to transit through the Suez Canal, 
they had to go all the way around Africa to get to Europe and the massive disruption that caused the world trade, it fueled inflation, it meant the shortages of stuff in Europe. That's a good example of the globalisation of trade. It shows how dependent we are on these trade links, you know. Um, so production and trade, also things like banking and finance, the operation of multinational corporations, foreign ownership of business, you know. I mean, you're all, you know, most of you have got laptops, you know, you're using a laptop right now. Where did that come from? Well, probably the, the components of it, I mean, many of them probably came from China, but the components of it, various components may well have come from different parts of the world, you know. Or if you've got a car, it's likely that the different components of your car were made in different parts of the world. It might have been assembled in Europe, but from bits all over the world. And that's the norm now. Um, of course, a lot of this is driven by technological change. I think the rise of the internet has been very important. It kind of, obviously, is a communications medium, but also from an economic perspective as well. Um, we're seeing increased movement of people. Um, again, it's far easier today than, to get around than it ever was. Um, I mean, just a, a century ago, just to get to the US, you know, you were talking a voyage of a week or two. You had to get on a ship and, you know, you're talking a voyage of a week or two. I mean, the first transatlantic flight had not even occurred 100 years ago today. Nobody had even flown the Atlantic. I think 1927 was the first time that happened. Um, whereas today, <coughs> you just hop on a plane, you know, and you're in the US in four or five hours. Um, so increased move, and, and it's not just the, you know, the, the speed, but it's also the you know, relatively cheap air travel. I mean, it may not feel cheap, but, you know, it's, it's relatively cheap. Most most of us, certainly most of us in, in developed countries, we can afford to get around. Um, so increased movement of people, increased movement of goods, but also increased movement of capital, i.e. money, uh, which, again, is much easier than it was in the past. You just press a button, you make the transfer. It's, you know, uh, again, digitalization of communications, you can transfer cash like that, the speed of light. Um, but also the movement of information and ideas and that means all kinds of ideas, it could mean political ideas, it could mean religious ideas, it could mean ideologies, um, you know, cultural stuff, um, down to I guess, things like music and other aspects of culture. Um, you know, um, they kind of flow from one part of the world to another in ways which are unprecedented, or at least, you know, at speeds which are unprecedented. I'm not saying there's never any information flow before, but not at this speed. So we're seeing kind of the interlinking of social relations, we're seeing this dynamic of action from the local to the global, and we're seeing this cultural exchange. And to some extent, we can talk about a single civilization emerging. You know, yes, there are still cultural differences. I mean, you know, China and Europe are still quite different. You know, India and the US are still quite different. You know, um, Africa and South America are still quite different. There are still cultural differences. But increasingly, we have a sense also of different cultural influences merging together and forming a, a global civilization for the first time. And that's brand new. You know, in uh, ten, you know, eight, ten thousand years of of human history, that's that's never happened before, not in this way and on this scale. So again, the so what question? Well, for us, you know, as I are scholars, we're seeing a very different world to the world that existed when I are first emerged as a discipline. So if you remember what we said, you know, international relations as a discipline in its own right, as distinct from other disciplines such as history, which it kind of grew out of. Um, but as a discipline in its own right, international relations has existed since um, 1919. But the world in 1919 was a very, very, very different world to the one we see today. It was very much a world of nation states. <coughs> And to some extent, it is still a world of nation states. I'm not saying the nation state has gone away and that it's irrelevant, but there's now also this this new level. Um, there's this new level of political and social and cultural interaction, um, which transcends the nation state. And again, that's important for us because maybe even to some extent undermines the Westphalian nation-state nation and that model of political organisation. 
So again, I'm sure we can think of lots of examples of globalisation. The global financial crisis of 2007, 8. I mean, again, most of you are probably kids when this happened, but you may still remember it. Um, you know, global brands, we see them everywhere. You know, I mean, there used to be... McDonald's used to boast that they had a, a restaurant in every country. I don't think that's quite quite true, if it ever was, but it's not far off. You know, Apple, Nike, you can see people using Apple products, wearing Nike clothing in any part of the world. Uh, we've already mentioned internationalisation of production, um, globalised entertainment. You know, we watch the same movies the world over, more or less. Um, <coughs> You know, social media, again, we all use social media. We know how easy it is to communicate with people in other parts of the world, and we kind of take that for granted. Um, the operation of NGOs at the global level. Global food, you know, what are you going to eat tonight? You're going to have an Indian, you're going to have a Chinese, you know, you're going to have an Italian. Um, you know, are you going to have some mixture of those things? Down to things like food, and food is, is an aspect of culture, you know? Uh, things like music as well. Tourism. Again, I'm guessing most of you have been to various countries, you know, you've visited various different parts of the world. Um, again, it's very easy now. Sports, global sports. Again, some of you probably watch Formula One, I'm sure most of you watch the football, you know. Um, things like the World Cup, international tournaments and so on. International football transfers, you know, footballers from different parts of the world coming to play in Europe and so on. Um, migration on a big scale, again, politically, you know, topical issue, of course. Um, <coughs> the fact of the matter is, people have always moved about. I mean, again, we all originated in East Africa. If there'd never been any, you know, migration, that's where we all still would be. So migration is has always happened since the beginning of human history. But the speed and the scale of migration, that's new. You know, people have always moved about, but the ability to move, you know, vast distances in a relatively short time scale and the number of people are migrating which again is kind of just a function of the number of people on the planet you know and that's another important point you need to be aware of and, and you know many of the issues that we talk about in world politics have to do with the fact that there are just far more people you know uh, they you know 100 years ago there was something like two billion people on the planet um a hundred years before that less than a billion for much of human history, there's been something like half a billion or less. Now there's 8 billion. By the end of this century, there'll be 12 billion. There's a lot more people than there ever were. And that's a big part of, you know, um, a lot of the issues that we talk about. I and mean, things like environmental issues, you know, um, a big part of the reason why we're using so much more energy and producing so much more carbon is there's just a lot more of us doing it, you know. Um, and again, that feeds into things like migration, because if you've got heavy population in one area, and particularly if you get issues like climate change, I mean, you know, I'm not even considering things like war or conflict, things like climate change. If you're living in a part of Africa where, you know, um, traditionally you know, you've been able to sustain the population, you've grown crops, you know, the land has been fertile enough, you've been able to sustain the population, suddenly you've got a much bigger population, and because of climate change, the land no longer produces enough food. What are you going to do? You're going to move. You're going to have to move. You can't do anything else. If you stay where you are, you're going to starve. So you've got to move. So, you know, um, we've got trends of vast numbers of people <coughs> wanting to move to another place. And of course, with all of the issues that that brings with it. Um, we've talked about international crime, um, terrorism. We've already kind of mentioned that before. Um, again, environmental issues. And, and again, the environment is a very good example of a global issue. You know, I mean, we have all of this stuff in the UK, you know, we have various politicians saying, oh yeah, this is what the UK is doing to become net zero. And we have all of the protesters sort of gluing themselves to things and so on, saying the UK <coughs> needs to become net zero. Yeah, great, the UK, UK becomes net zero. What difference is that going to make? Well, if no one else goes net zero, it's going to make absolutely no difference whatsoever. The UK produces less than 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm not saying we don't have a contribution to make, but the point is, any action that we take, if other countries don't play ball, it's not going to make a blind bit of difference. Climate change is still going to happen, the UK is still going to be affected by it. So, the climate change, other environmental issues, 
they can only be dealt with at the global level. They can't be dealt with by you know, individual countries, individual governments. You know, we talk about sovereignty, but the reality is individual governments don't have sovereignty in this area because they don't have the power to make those decisions um, you know, and, and make any difference to these issues, not at a unilateral level. There has to be agreement at a multilateral level. So the environment is a good example of a global issue, something which can only be dealt with at the global level. Um, you know, or at a more mundane level, you know, sitting at home in the UK, you might be eating Indian food, you might be watching an American movie, you might be talking to your friend in Australia, using a device made in China, you know, and that's, we do that every day, we do that every single day, you know. Um, but that's, you know, <laughs> the fact that it is so mundane and we don't even think about it. Um, but again, all of this is, is very, very new. This, this globalisation of culture just didn't exist. Globalisation of trade just didn't exist 100 years ago, and even less, two or three or four or 500 years ago. So again, it, it, is it a new phenomenon? Yes, it is, in terms of the scale and form of it. Now, that's not to say that there were never any links between civilizations. Of course, there were. We know, for example, that... Um, the Romans did a certain amount of trade with ancient China, you know, um, probably not directly, but kind of the Silk Road running through Persia, what is now Iran, through the Middle East into what was the Roman Empire. We know that trade goods came from China into Rome and stuff went in the opposite direction. Um, there's archaeological evidence for that. There's, you know, European goods found in China and Chinese goods found in Europe in the period. Um, you know, we know that um, later on, in it's sort of uh, the Viking era, there have been kind of uh, statues of Buddha found in, you know, uh, in Scandinavia, um, and vice versa, you know, um, European goods found in the Far East. So, you know, the trade links existed even that far back, but it wasn't on a big scale, you know, and the few people who did travel would have been merchants. It wasn't something that most people, you know, the average... European or the average person in most parts of the world probably had never been more than a few miles from the place where they were born. You know, you were born, lived and died in the same place. You know, if you'd been to the next village, you were well travelled. And that was the norm for most people right up until relatively <coughs> recent times. So there was some level of globalisation, but nothing like what we later saw. Of course, the uh, phenomenon kind of picked up pace really in the colonial era. Um, it's not just about colonialism, but colonialism was a driver of it, of course. Um, but also it was about kind of the technology that evolved around that time. So although we're not yet on to planes and stuff, we are talking about, um, you know, ships for the first time were seaworthy enough to, to cross oceans like the Atlantic. We know the Vikings did it, we know the Vikings got to North America, but... Um, and we also know that even before that, they were kind of amazing voyages. I mean, how did the Aboriginal peoples get to Australia? They must have got there by sea, you know? Um, and they must have, you know, it's believed they did it by putting together what, on the surface, looked like quite primitive craft, but obviously seaworthy enough, you know, to get them from Asia to Australia, probably hopping from island to island. So again, it's not brand new, um, but we saw... You know, in kind of the early modern period, we saw Europeans building ships, which for the first time were kind of reliably seaworthy enough to make long voyages, not hopping from island to island, uh, but actually making long voyages and even to circumnavigate the globe. Um, then, of course, we saw the industrial age, we saw the speeding up of technology, we saw things like, you know, the first steam powered ships and the first iron hulled ships and you know ultimately this then led on to technologies like early aircraft although aircraft were still very primitive in 1914 uh, but again it was the beginnings of the sorts of transport communications technologies we see today and again not only just about travel or even just about trade um, but also things like the first electronic communications you know the first telegraphs the first you know Kind of ancestor of the internet was the wireless telegraph. You know, it was, yeah, it was pretty primitive. You had one guy at one end, like kind of tapping a tapping a button, tapping out Morse code, and someone else translating it at the other end. 
pretty damn primitive, but it was, in a sense, the ancestor of the, the communications networks we have today. It was the ancestor of the internet. Um, so, you know, <coughs> there, there is precedent, but it's really the 20th century to the present that we're talking about. You know, the phenomenon of globalisation as we understand it today is pretty new. The scale of it and the complexity of it um, and the technological sophistication <coughs> of it is really pretty new. Um, so again, driven largely by advances in technology, so we've mentioned transport technology, we've mentioned communications technology, but there are other factors as well. Um, so again, we talked a bit, we started to talk a bit about, you know, international organisations, intergovernmental organisations, organisations like the World Trade Organisation, promoting free trade. Um, you know, we, we, we've kind of we've kind of touched on things like um, differences in labour costs or the fact that it's just <coughs> cheaper to shift production to another part of the world. And again, that's causing all kinds of issues. That's, in, in one sense, that's why we're so dependent on China. Um, and we never really thought about it that much until kind of the pandemic and so on disrupted all of that and made us realise just how vulnerable we are. But why would you open a factory in the UK? If you're a company and your sole purpose is to make profit, why would you op open a manufacturing facility in the UK? The UK is an expensive place to, to live. You know, UK workers demand a certain amount of pay. You know, I mean, we might think that we're not well paid, but compared with much of the rest of the world, we are. Um, and labour costs are much, much higher in the UK. If you can open that same factory in China or another place in the East, you've still got access to high technology, you've still got access to a skilled workforce, but they'll work for a lot less, which, which increases your profit margin. Um, which is the reason why European and American industry became less and less competitive, because someone else can do it for less. Um, and if you're a corporation, that's all you're interested in, the bottom line, how much profit can it make? Cheap labour. Um, you know, again, uh, internationalisation of finance and banking. So once again, the ease of moving capital around the globe. You know, it's at one time moving money around the globe meant kind of loading gold bricks onto a ship or silver onto a ship. These days, I just press a button, do a transfer, and it's, it's done in a second. You know, and the ease of moving goods around the world. Again, modern container ships, you know, we're talking, in some cases, we're talking ships which are 500,000 million tonnes. You know, we're talking enormous vessels, you know. Um, I mean, v vessels which, again, 100 years ago would have been unthinkable. I mean, you've all heard of the Titanic, which, of course, wasn't a cargo ship, it was a passenger ship, but notable because of its size in 1912, 46,000 tonnes or something like that. That's an enormous ship in 1912. It's a rowing boat compared to a modern cargo ship. It's tiny, you know, um, talking a million tonne vessel. So the, the ability to move bulk goods around. Um, so again, it's, it's about technological advance, uh, advancement, but also developments in the economic system, which have kind of been facilitated by that, but which also have driven that. So that links into this idea of interdependence, and again, we talked about that last week when we talked about liberalism, we talked about how interdependence is an important concept for liberals. Of course, we mentioned Robert Cahane and Joseph Nye, important names, remember those names, um, they're kind of the fathers of neoliberal institutionalism. So again, Cahane and Nye spoke of interdependence as being kind of one of the most important phenomena in world politics today. Um, and it's based again on the idea that states are dependent on other states for the things that they can't efficiently produce themselves, you know, resulting in the fact that states are inextricably tied together um, by their econ economic dependence on each other. And of course, neoliberal institutionalists say that this is a good thing in a way because this promotes cooperation. Because they argue that states are kind of rational enough to see, well, look, we need each other, we can't afford to go to war, you know, we can't afford disruption because we're all stuffed if, if trade links break down. So um, this economic dependence promotes political 
corporation as well, according to liberals. Of course, realists would deny that. Realists would say, pie in the sky, interdependence doesn't make any real difference to the power struggle among states. They're not saying it doesn't exist, but they're saying ultimately it's still about the powerful states. And the powerful states are going to go out and grab the resources that they want to grab. So, again, you know, we can look at Russia in Ukraine, we can look at China, you know, we can look at Chinese expansionism, we can look at the US in the Middle East, you know, really would say that these are all examples that, in actual fact, the powerful states are going to go out and grab what they want to grab. So, interdependence is a thing, but it doesn't change the underlying power system, according to realists. Marxists, now we've not talked about Marxism yet, uh, that's the next topic after Digital Week, but Marxists would see interdependence, globalisation in different terms. They would see it as the inevitable expansion of the capitalist system to swallow up the whole world, you know. Um, capitalism to a Marxist is what it does. Capitalism has to grow to survive. It can't stay still, it has to grow to survive. And Marxism is an inherently exploitative system. You know, it cannot, and again we'll talk more about this when we get on to Marxism. But the idea that, you know, um, your capitalism is based on profit. It's based on the extraction of profit. How do you extract profit? Well, you have to um, screw someone over, basically. You have to get someone to work for you. You pay them as little as possible and you take the fruits of their labour and, you know, the difference between what you pay them and what you sell the stuff that they've made for, that's your profit as a capitalist. <coughs> So you have to exploit people. You know, capitalism can't work without exploitation from a, from a Marxist perspective. Um, so it's inevitable that capitalism is going to say, OK, how do we continue to increase our profits? Well, you know, look at the, the so-called developing world. Um, you know, there's a huge untapped potential out there. There's lots of cheap labour that we can exploit. There's lots of resources that we can exploit. We need to expand. And that's what capitalism inevitably does from a Marxist perspective. Um, so yeah, interdependence, the different theories would agree that it exists, but they would interpret it in different ways. Now, whether interdependence and globalisation is the same thing, that's something that we could discuss. Cahain and I say that it is, so they say that globalisation is really just interdependence on steroids. But others would argue that uh, globalisation involves a fundamental shift. So again, what they would say is it makes less and less sense to talk about national economies. What is the British economy? Because in a sense, the British economy is linked in with the global economy to such a large extent that it becomes increasingly difficult to draw a line around it and say this is the British economy here and this is the, you know, the outside world because it's all so interlinked. So in a sense, it makes more and more sense to talk about a single global economy rather than a series of national economies. So yeah, um, globalisation certainly is helping to create more wealth from the point of view of you know, industrial capitalism. It is creating more wealth. Is everyone benefiting from that wealth? No. <coughs> now again, you know, this is kind of, you know, I'm not saying you necessarily have to follow a Marxist perspective, but I think Marxism does have a point in saying that, you know, um, some sections of global society are benefiting from this a lot more than others. The reality is that the gap between the world's poorest and the world's richest ain't getting smaller, it's getting bigger. So again, if we look at the richest and poorest countries, now bear in mind, this, these figures have already been adjusted for purchasing power parity. So we know that, you know, a dollar or the equivalent of a dollar, you know, in South Sudan is going to buy you a lot more than a dollar would in the US or Europe. We know that. But that's, this, these figures have already been adjusted to take that into account. So these are comparable figures. So the richest country in the world by head of population per capita is Luxembourg, you know. The average income in Luxembourg, or the, the average GDP per capita, is a hundred, this is in dollars, so a hundred and forty thousand, over a hundred and forty thousand dollars. 
that doesn't mean everyone in Luxembourg earns $140,000. There are a lot of people on a lot less money than that, of course. Um, but the average GDP per capita in Luxembourg, 140,000. You know, so by any population, far and away the richest country in the world. Singapore, Singapore is actually not that far behind. And Ireland is not that far behind. Ireland, right next door to us. Um, the US is somewhere down the table in ninth place, 76,000. The UK <coughs> is actually down in 28th. You know, now we think of ourselves as a rich country, and we are a rich country, but we're not one of the very richest countries anymore in terms of GDP per head of population. If you look at kind of GDP, nominal GDP as a whole, we're in something like sixth or seventh place, depending on how you work it out. That's only because we're a relatively big country with a population of 65, 70 million. But per head of population, yeah, we're pretty well up the table. I mean, out of 195 countries or so, we're in 28. So we are pretty well up the table. But we're still not one of the very richest countries. But still, compared to the countries at the bottom, you know, <coughs> we're absolutely loaded. I mean, look at, you know, the average GDP in some of the countries near the bottom. I mean, particular countries like Burundi, $856. That's, that's the average GDP. So if you're living in Burundi, that's the kind of money you might have to live on for a year. You know, less than $1,000. You might have to live on that for a year. You know, uh, or you might even get less than that. I mean, that's the average. So you might be on less than that. You know, South Sudan, not much more. Central African Republic, just over 1000 Democratic Republic of the Congo, you know, similar sort of territory. You know, and, and, you know, notice, notice all of these are African countries as well. You know, all of the world's poorest countries are all in Africa. That's not to say that there are poor countries in other parts of the world as well, but, you know, the poorest countries in Africa are the poorest countries in the world. So again, globalisation, is everyone benefiting from it? Well, that data doesn't seem to suggest so. Um, so that kind of brings us on to talk about neoliberalism. Now I mentioned this in the seminar last week. Don't confuse the terms neoliberalism and neoliberal institutionalism. They sound very, very similar and students very often confuse the two. They shorten the term neoliberal institutionalism and talk about neoliberalism. But don't fall into that trap because it actually means something different. So neoliberal institutionalism is the positivist um, theory of IR, which is kind of the counterpart to neorealism. Neoliberalism is an economic theory. And it's basically the idea of free market fundamentalism, if you like. It's the belief, for me, the, the ideology. It's, it's, this, is, this is ideological. Um, it's the ideology that um, free market capitalism is um, <coughs> the only possible economic system that works and that free market capitalism is the only way to kind of increase wealth which will ultimately for the, be for the benefit of everyone. So you remember, you know, last autumn, you remember Liz Truss talking about how we need to free the market, we need to cut taxes, we need to deregulate um, because there'll be this trickle down effect, you know. Um, I mean a mate of mine told me, that, you know, told me a joke about that. Um, you know, saying, yeah, I passed this homeless guy on the street and I thought, I feel really sorry for that guy. So I went round to the poshest house I could find and I posted 20 quid through the letterbox because it will trickle down to the homeless guy, you know. And yeah, we can laugh about it, but it's it's kind of a you know it's a serious belief. This idea that if you make the rich richer, some of that wealth will find its way down to the poorest as well, and ultimately everybody benefits from you know unbridled free trade, free market capitalism. So again, this was uh, particularly in the West in um, the latter part of the 20th century, kind of 1980s, 1990s in particular. Uh, in the academic world, it was based on the ideas of people like Milton Friedman. In the political world, it was pushed by people like Ronald Reagan in the US, people like Margaret Thatcher in the UK, um, and they strongly pushed this ideology. 
and they effectively imposed it on the rest of the world <coughs> because the wealthy countries, and particularly the US, but also the other kind of global north powers who, you know, all to one extent or another, were kind of embraced this, this neoliberal ideology, <coughs> they controlled the financial institutions, institutions like the International Monetary Fund, institutions like the World Bank. So if you're a poor country, if you're a developing country and you need to develop, where are you going to get the capital from? Where are you going to get the money from? Well, you've got to go, there are alternatives now, but certainly back then, um, you needed to go to the World Bank and say, make us a loan, we need to borrow some money. And the World Bank are going to say, yeah, yeah, you know, we'll lend you some money, but there are restrictions, you know, you've got to do certain things, you've got to embrace a neoliberal model. And even more so, the IMF. The IMF is the lender of last resort. So if you're a government, you can't pay your bills. You know, let's say that, you know, you, you basically, your debts are, you, you've got this huge deficit, your debts are mounting up, you're not making enough in tax to cover it, you can't pay your bills, you're about to, you know, face national bankruptcy effectively. What do you do? You go to the IMF and say, bail us out. And the IMF say, yeah, yeah, we'll bail you out, but you've got to follow a particular agenda. And this particular agenda is a neoliberal agenda. So things like rule of the market, um, things like cutting public expenditure. So you, you want some money from us, well you have to cut your public services, because that's not efficient. The private sector, leave it to the private sector. So, you know, education, health, welfare, no, nah, you can't afford any of that. Get rid of that stuff and we'll lend you some money. Um, Privatisation, you've got some nationalised industries, well neoliberals don't believe in, uh, in nationalised industries, so get them privatised if you want our help. Deregulation, um, you know, workers' rights, no, 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 it's interfering with the market, we don't want any of that workers' rights stuff, get rid of that, you know. Um, environmental standards, no, get rid of that, you know. Um, but also things like tariff barriers, if you've kind of got tariff barriers. Um, on goods coming into your country. Again, they will force you to get rid of those tariff barriers. You might think, well, why is that such a bad thing? Well, again, if you're a developing country, you're just trying to get your own industry off the ground, it's very difficult to do that when you're competing against cheap imports from established industrial countries, because inevitably they can produce stuff cheaper than you can. Why? Because they're a lot bigger, economies of scale, you know, they've, they've a lot more practice at doing it, they can produce goods a lot more cheap, a lot more cheaper than you can. So, if we take kind of cars, for example, who's going to buy a car produced in your country if it costs a lot more than, than importing one from Japan or China or whatever? They're not going to do it. So, the idea of tariff barriers says, right, well, basically, we'll tax, we'll put tariffs, we'll tax imported goods, and then, and then the foreign cars will be more expensive than the cars we produce at home, so then people you know, will buy our cars and we can get our industry off the ground. So it's the idea of using tariffs to stimulate the development of local industry. But of course, <laughs> then the IMF are coming along, the World Bank are coming along saying, nah, you can't do that, get rid of those tariff barriers, otherwise you get no help from us. So again, it's kind of opening up markets in developing, co in developing countries to having cheap goods dumped on them from the developed world. Um, it's the same with things like agriculture, you know, if you're a farmer in a, a poor country, you know, um, you know, the, the EU, for example, has got massive amounts of agricultural surplus that it needs to get rid of because of the common agricultural policy. So the EU comes along, and the EU does this, you know, comes along and says, okay, we'll sign a trade agreement with you, but you've got to kind of reduce your tariff barriers. And suddenly, you the poor farmer are struggling because you know you you you're just about scraping along, making a living. But now you've got kind of cheap agricultural produce from Europe coming into your country, being sold for next to nothing, undercutting you. So you can't sell your stuff. So you're now in, in even deeper poverty than you were before. You've lost your livelihood. So again, you know this this free trade stuff doesn't always work if you're a developing country might work to the advantage of the rich countries, the, the already industrialised countries, doesn't necessarily work well for the poorer countries, the developing countries. Um, and of course, you know, the IMF and World Bank uses these vehicles to push this. Um, the developing countries kind of, um, you know, being um, 
forced into debt traps effectively. It's kind of almost a form of neo-colonialism. We'll talk more about that when we talk about neo-Marxist perspectives. We <coughs> come across the phrase Washington Consensus. And without going into detail as to what the Washington Consensus is, this is kind of the basic standard package of reform that the IMF um, and World Bank and ultimately behind this the US Treasury Department are seeking to impose on the Global South. Um, so again, they don't really have much choice. You want to borrow some money from us, you sign up to this, you follow the Washington Consensus. So again, where does that leave sovereignty? You know, where does that leave sovereignty? And, and where does it leave, you know, decolonization? You know, the, the global north is effectively saying to these countries, okay, you're now independent, you're no longer a colony, you've got your own flag and your own national anthem, but you're still going to have to follow policies that the global north imposes upon you. In a sense, you're still a colony, really. You know, it's just just not quite so overt, they're a bit more subtle about it. Um, so anyway, that's what critics argue, that the free market model opens up developing countries to exploitation by Western capitalist corporations, merely entrenches inequality. Of course, neoliberals say, no, 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 it's going to make everyone richer, you know. Free market economics is ultimately going to generate more wealth, and that wealth ultimately is going to make everyone better off. Um... So yeah, you know, despite the arguably good intentions <coughs> of structural by structural adjustment, we mean this kind of stuff of okay, we're going to get you out of debt by cutting public services and privatising your industry and so on. You know, the reality is that this very often leads to more harm than good. It fails to bring the developing countries out of poverty. Arguably, it's making the problem worse in some cases. Um, so again, this idea of fiscal consolidation. You know, oh yeah, we're going to balance the books. Well, balancing the books might mean cutting social welfare. It might mean cutting spending on health. It might mean cutting spending on education, for example. That's not going to make people... That's certainly not going to increase their quality of life. It's not going to make them richer in the long term either. Um, we've already mentioned how removal of tariff barriers can lead to poor countries being flooded with foreign imported goods. Um, and of course, private companies are interested in profit. They're not interested in social objectives. That's not what they're about. They're not charities. They're interested in profits. So very often, when you privatise these industries, it means that people who can't afford to pay don't receive any service. So in Bolivia, for example, the World Bank forced Bolivia to privatise its water industry with the result that, you know, um, people who couldn't afford to pay the bills were simply cut off, they didn't have a water supply. Now, there is an alternative. Increasingly in recent years, there is an alternative to the World Bank and the IMF, and it comes from China. As China has um, <coughs> become richer and become this industrial powerhouse, it's kind of sought to set up its own global financial system and offer an alternative source of funding, an alternative source of loans through things like the Asian Development Bank as a rival to the World Bank. Um, and the interesting thing about the Chinese approach is that it's a bit different because they're not imposing the same conditions. Uh, they, they're saying that, okay, take this money and invest it in developing infrastructure. So you want to build some railways? No, no problem. China will fund that. You want to build some ports? You want to build some roads? China will fund all of that, you know. Um, we will um, provide the funding to provide sort of genuine development um, and kind of an interventionist approach, rather than leaving it all to the free market, whereas the, the, the neoliberal approach is the market will deal with it all. The Chinese are saying, no, actually, you know, state-sponsored programs are absolutely fine and we'll, prov we'll provide the funding to help you to do that. So on the surface, that sounds like, yeah, good old Chinese, you know, they're really helping the world. But, you know, arguably this is another form of neocolonialism in a slightly different guise. Um, because, again, it's, it's kind of establishing China's economic power. And very often, the countries are still getting in the debt trap, they're just indebted to China now. And what China often does, and this is written into the contract, We've built your railway, you can't pay for it? No problem, we'll just take it over. It's now Chinese-owned railway, it's owned by a Chinese company, which effectively means the Chinese state. You know, um, things like, you know, ports. We've built you a port, you can't pay for them, you can't pay for it? No, no problem, we'll just take over your port, we'll just foreclose on it. 
Um, I mean, this this even that happened in in Europe, uh, particularly in Montenegro when China funded a highway there, which you know the country couldn't pay for, so China took over the highway. Um, so this is kind of you know allowing China to kind of get various countries in debt traps. Yeah. When you say they took over a highway, what do you mean? Like when you say they're taking over things, ba basically, how, how are they sort of making taking over and like making profit off of like a highway? It's something? now run by a Chinese company, so I mean I don't know if they're charging tolls for it. Uh, it might probably a toll road, something like that. So it's like right, fair enough. This is now run by a Chinese company, and you know the money that we make from it goes back to China. But it's kind of not quite Chinese sovereign territory, but kind of almost. It's kind of it's not just about the money. It's partly about that, but it's also about saying we control part of your infrastructure now, so we now have power in your country. Right. So it's it's a power thing as well. It's not just about making profits. It's partly about that, but it's also about a power thing. It's about you're beholden to China, and, and in a sense, you start to become almost a satellite state of China. And, and and again, this is no different really to what the West has been doing all these years. It's not. I'm not saying China is you know any more of a big villain than we are but China essentially is doing the same sorts of things that the West has done um, you know in a slightly different form slightly different guys but for me it's kind of this is about power it's, it's back to China you know as the emerging superpower flexing its muscles and, and setting up this kind of system of neo-colonial domination which is only what we've done as well um, but it's now China's turn, they're getting in on the act if you like, you know. Um, so yeah, it's, it's still exploitative, just in a, taking a slightly different form. Of course the PRC denies these allegations, it, it, it says that, you know, it's economic links with partner nations, as we're developing infrastructure, you know, we're helping to create jobs, we're helping to boost wealth, transfer technology and knowledge and so on. And maybe some of that's even true. I'm not saying that that is never ever true. So people might be richer, they might be better off, but kind of under Chinese control, you know. Um, and, and again, that's what empires do. Um, you know, if you go back as far as Roman Britain, for example, I mean, was, was you know, being part of the Roman Empire, was it good for Britain? Of course it was, you know. We, we, we got roads, we got towns, we got baths, we got all of this, you know. Um, all, all of this stuff, but it was still a colony of Rome, it was still controlled by Rome. So I'm not saying that China isn't necessarily, you know, the, the infrastructure funding isn't beneficial to local people, it is to an extent, but it comes at a price, and the price is effective domination by China. You know, you effectively become a satellite state of China. So again, a form of colonialism, arguably. So again, a lot of this is kind of not just, you know, some of the, the key players in this are not just states, but also transnational corporations. And we kind of mentioned those briefly before, um, you know, um, but um, globalization, you know, allowing <coughs> many companies to set up production facilities abroad. This is what we call inward investment. So again, you know, countries very keen to attract him with investment because it brings that technology transfer, it brings that money, you know, from, from the, the corporation's point of view, you know, it, again, there's, uh, you know, a lot of benefits to be able to access cheap labour, being able to access the resources and so on. You know, corporations generally are not patriotic, they're not tied to a particular country. You know, they are actors in their own right. And particular, you know, the particular looking to maximise their own profit and their own interests, not those of, of any particular country. Um, so again, we can think of lots of examples. I'm just going quite quickly now because we're getting a little bit short on time. But you know, you can think of lots of examples. You know, Toyota, Nike, and so on. Um, you know, transnational corporations. You know, got a lot of um, you know um, incentives to expand overseas and local governments have a lot of incentive to go along with that because of the money that it brings into the country and so on. But unfortunately, again, this often leads to exploitation. Governments, you know, particularly governments in poor countries, in developing countries, they don't feel that they can regulate these corporations effectively. Because they need the money, you know, they can, you know, basically feel as though they almost have to let them get away with exploitative practices, you know, stuff which would not be acceptable. And again, this is part of the reason why the companies want to go there. If you want to open a factory in the UK, you've got to adhere to health and safety regulations, you've got to adhere to minimum wages, 
you've got to do things like provide pensions and you know um, provide you know um, sick pay and all that kind of stuff and you know health and safety standards whereas in a developing country there might not be any of that stuff and the government might be reluctant to introduce it because they don't want to drive away the transnational corporation so you know the the corporation can get away with some pretty exploitative stuff again they're also they're draining away local resources they may even not create much local employment but even if they do you know it's very often in a very exploitative basis um you know they have this economic and political leverage because you know the, the developing countries are so desperate to have them there and have them bring their money and their expertise and resources and they have this massive amount of, of leverage you know they, so they may pay a little tax in the host economy um, exploitation of cheap labor you know use of suppliers with the you know really bad standards on labor rights um, you know, probably one of the most famous examples, and it's some years ago, it's going back nearly 40 years, but Union Carbide, the Bhopal disaster, you may even have heard of it. It's going all the way back to 1984, so it's quite a long time ago. Um, but it's a good example of, you know, a Western corporation which built a, a pesticide plant in a place called Bhopal, which is in India. Um, and this pesticide plant, again, no regulation, no adherence to the kind of health and safety standards that would be required in, you know, a European country. Um, and, you know, they just basically didn't, didn't give a damn, you know, about health and safety standards. And it ended up with a kind of a highly toxic cloud of chemical gas being released. This cloud spread down into the town, gassed, you know, two and a half thousand people. Uh, well, a lot more people, actually, two and a half thousand were just the people who died immediately. Uh, many others got gassed and survived but suffered long term health problems and died prematurely. So, we're talking thousands and thousands of people died in this disaster. And Union Carbide just basically shrugged their shoulders and were not even willing to pay any compensation. <coughs> they were eventually forced to pay compensation in a court case, but even then, it was kind of a trivial amount, it was a minimal amount. So again, this is a good egg, it's an extreme case, but it illustrates how a developing country which needs a corporation's jobs, needs its capital, may not have the ability to enforce the sorts of standards that the corporation may have to observe at home. I'm a little bit short on time, but I think we've enough time to cover this. So a good example of the kind of, kind of moving to kind of financial affairs now. Um, so talking about the global financial system and you know how interlinked that has become the 2007 global financial crisis is still a good example both of you know how interlinked the world is but also of the inherent instability of this system so the financial crisis as you may know had its origins in the subprime lending crisis in the US but quickly spread to the rest of the world. What do we mean by subprime lending? Well, basically, um, we mean financial institutions making loans to people who might not be able to repay. And again, this is linked to what I was saying about increasingly, you know, capitalism moving towards seeking something for nothing, seeking a bigger, bigger and bigger return on investments without necessarily creating it. <coughs> So, um, you know, again, at one time, um, if you wanted to buy a house, you had to have a particular income. Banks would generally wouldn't loan you any more than something like three and a half times your annual income. Um, and basically, you had to be, um, you know, look like you're a pretty fair bet to be able to pay the debt back before they would lend you the money. But subprime um, is one of the things that caused house prices to rocket, both here in the US was basically um, the practice of giving anyone a loan, more or less, who wanted one, even if they weren't necessarily in a position to pay it back. And so you had a situation where people were borrowing larger and larger amounts of money, um, and, you know, realistically, some of them were never going to be able to pay it back. Um, so again, the idea was that, of course, you know, banks 
where do they get their money from? From investors. So people invest their money with the bank. The bank lends to mortgage customers. The mortgage customers pay the bank back. They don't just pay the loan back, they pay the interest back as well. Um, so the bank makes money, the investors makes money, and everyone's happy. The mortgage customers get the house, the bank makes money, the investors make money. But again, increasingly, you know, it's call it greed if you like, but this idea of making something for nothing. The investors thought that even though we're, we're you know, we're kind of lending money, or the financial institutions thought, even though we're lending money to people who might not be able to pay it back, they can't go wrong because if they don't pay it back, we just seize the house. And, you know, houses are going up in value all the time anyway, so we'll end up with an asset which was worth more than the value of the loan, so we can't lose. And of course that worked until the housing bubble went pop and then you know and prices started to crash but what made it even worse is that basically banks were kind of what we call bundling together these bad debts and selling them on to investors which very often were other banks not necessarily individual people but selling them on to investors with a you know yeah just just invest in this you know package and you can't go wrong you're going to make a a massive return for nothing essentially you know um, your you know 10 grand will become you know 20 grand or your million will become 2 million or whatever you can't go wrong you can't lose um, but basically it was all a bubble and bubbles go pop you know and as a result of this ultimately these uh, this this you know these these so-called investments effectively became worthless um, and as a result of this, of course, Lehman Brothers, which had been the fourth largest investment bank in the US, collapsed. Um, you know, other financial institutions kind of um, came close to collapse as well. Ultimately, the banks had to be bailed out by Congress. Um, but of course, it didn't stay on that side of the Atlantic because many of the investors who bought these American securities were financial institutions in other countries. So it quickly spread to Europe, where it kind of triggered the European debt crisis. Um, and of course, it then, you know, triggered a wider recession, because if the, you know, the, the banks are feeling the pinch, the banks can't offer credit, then other types of businesses can't make loans to invest in building new factories or building new stuff or whatever. So, you know, it means that consumers find it hard to get credit. If consumers find it hard, harder to get credit, then they spend less, which has another knock-on effect in, on business. So basically, you know, the whole thing just, um, you know, the whole system was teetering on the edge of collapse, which is why, of course, banks, you know, um, or ultimately governments, um, had to bail out the banking sector and paid for it by effectively turning on the printing press and printing money. And that's how they managed to avert disaster that time around and blow the bubble back up. But it's still all artificial, you know, and ultimately it's going to crumble at some point. Um, and of course, you know, the political effects of this, you know, the unemployment, the, the effects of national politics, the rise of populism. Um, you know, austerity programs. We saw austerity in the UK, but we've seen you know much much more severe austerity programs in other parts of Europe and elsewhere in the world. So, what are the political effects of that? Well, last time something like this happened, we ended up with Adolf Hitler. You know, because it's fertile ground for that kind of populist to come along. And you know, when when people are when economies crash, when people are feeling the pinch. You know, that's exactly the time when people like Adolf Hitler flourish, you know, so perhaps that's a warning for our own time. Um, so, yeah, you know, ultimately that's a good example of how a crisis which began in the US went global. Um, so, could this economic interdependence and the need to avoid further turbulence like this give impetus to greater cooperation? Again, think about what realists would say, think about what liberals would say, think about what Marxists would say. Um, Covid-19, another great example of globalisation. Again, there have always been new diseases emerging and spreading across the planet. It's happened many <coughs> times, of course. Perhaps the you know, most severe example would be the, the Black Death in the late Middle Ages. Um, but it, it, it didn't happen all that often. Um, and 
although you know viruses <coughs> jump from animals to humans quite regularly historically most of the time they didn't go very far why because people tended not to travel very much so if someone in a particular village you know got infected maybe they would spread the disease to the rest of their village but the chances are it would end there because you know there's not much chance of someone traveling outside the village and spreading it further but of course now when we have first of all so many people in the world far more than there ever been before but also when people are moving about so much then you know it's a matter of days or weeks you know before a new disease has spread across the whole planet and COVID-19 great example of that um, you know COVID was not a pleasant experience but actually it was relatively mild compared to some of the diseases that, that you know um, so is it going to happen again of course it is it's just a question of when it might be it might not be for 20 30 40 years but it might be next week um, but it will happen again and next time it might be worse we've mentioned the globalization of media and culture again this is a two-edged sword in some respects i think it's a great thing but at the same time we have to be aware that it can also erode local cultures and identities as well and that means a loss of diversity to some extent a loss of cultural diversity you know a loss of history if you like and that's not necessarily a good thing that's kind of a loss of loss of heritage um so double-edged sword um you know are we in danger of a monoculture and, you know and do we want to live on a planet where everywhere is the same in a sense you know um yeah diversity is a good thing you know and um do we really want everywhere to be the same you know um again yeah, there's lots of positive sides to it um but there are negatives as well language is a good example so again you know there are around 7,000 spoken languages in the world depending on how you define a language but you know there's one figure currently about 7,000 spoken languages in the world it has been estimated that at least half and maybe as many as 90 percent of those will be lost by 2100 that's a loss that is a cultural loss you know um on the other hand you know contact between speakers of different languages can result in a richer hybrid language english is a great example you know english is a you know a result of multiple languages merging together of course principally kind of germanic languages old english anglo-saxon merging with latin and you know norman french and then you know later on borrowing words from all around the world you know um english is a great example of a hybrid language and is the you know the most complex language in, in, in the world in terms of certainly the size of the vocabulary um, you know and, and that's a result of, of hybridization um, so that can be a good thing but again the loss of you know languages loss of culture isn't uh, we're running out of time but again similar thing with music the idea of world music people everywhere are listening to the same stuff you know and again merging of musical traditions sharing of musical traditions that can be great but it can also mean that local traditions are lost you know loss of heritage loss of local heritage um okay so we're pretty much out of time but you know in a nutshell as we can see globalization is complex it's not just a single phenomenon it's a set of processes it's a, a multifaceted phenomenon um, which essentially means a shift towards a, you know, um, a single globalised society, a single globalised economy. Of course, it didn't come out of nowhere, it didn't just start in the year 2000, it's a continuation of trends that have been going on for centuries, arguably for millennia. But we've seen a massive acceleration in globalisation in recent decades. It can be a threat to local cultures and identities, but it can also be a channel for aspects of global, local culture to kind of uh, enrich um, each other. Um, again, the theoretical paradigms have different perspectives on it. Really say globalisation doesn't really make any difference. We're still living in a world which is characterised by a power struggle between states. Liberals say economic, in, economic interdependence, free trade is good, it provides an incentive for cooperation, um, free market economics increases wealth for everyone, 
Marxists say that's a load of bullshit. Basically, capitalism is an inherently exploitative system, and globalization means the shift of the class struggle to the global level, the exploitation of the global poor by the global elite, etc. Constructivists, we've not even touched constructivism yet, but they would particularly be interested in the transfer of ideas and the effects of globalization on uh, shaping and reshaping identities. All right, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone else wants to use this rule. Anyone got any questions before we wrap up? Are they all good, yeah?